Matthew chapter 20 and the first 16 verses, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And this morning I particularly want to look at uh, the idea of God's generous heart. God's generous heart. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were, who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he asked one of them, friend, am I being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I, if I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am, a gen because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The thing about a parable is, of course, that you can only take it so far. And there is a limit to its meaning and we mustn't push it beyond its limit and we need to be careful not to do that uh, today because it would be very easy to make something out of this that really isn't there so uh, so we're going to watch that a little bit but um, the basic parable is uh, there's this man he's gone out to find some workers it's harvest time uh, and he needs to get his grapes in and he's been hiring people throughout the day and at the end of it the shock horror that he pays everybody the same amount those that have worked for 12 hours and those that have worked for one hour they get the same uh, money at the end of the day and some think this is very unfair uh, of him and uh, as I say you know you could turn this into some kind of employment law um, uh, scenario if you wanted to but that's not the intention of it um, you know you can just imagine if there was somebody who was part of some workers' union today, they'd be really up. I could just see the steam coming from the mirrors now, you know, at the very thought of such injustice. But it's not about that. It's about something completely different. And we need to get beyond that picture to get to the real heart of what is going on. Now, a little bit of explanation, uh, because uh, this is perhaps a situation that would be unfamiliar with most of us on how it would work. As I say, it is harvest time, and uh, at harvest time, the grapes need to come in very quickly. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, how quickly they need to get them in, but as soon as grapes are ready, it's, it's wise to get them in fast. And I think there are several reasons for that. My mind goes back, uh, you know, 20, 30 years plus, I guess now, to uh, the adverts that they used to have for Jolly Green Giant sweet corn. 
and um, how they used to tell you that they were just waiting until the sweet corn got to its absolute sweetest point. And there, in the middle of the night, suddenly, these lights come on. There are all these people out in the field gathering in the sweet corn. Now, I really don't think that that's what they do with the sweet corn. But um, it's what they wanted to show you is that at the, the right time, at the right moment, they had to get out there. They couldn't lose any time. They had to get out there. Um, another one would be the uh, advert would be the man from Del Monte. He say yes. Um, and, you know, many of you remember that advert too. And again, it was you couldn't pick um, the oranges until they were at their absolute sweetest. And when it got to that point, that's when you had to get out there and do it. Now, with the grapes, actually, it's also true that there was a time to pick and you had to get them at just the right moment. It's no good saying, oh, well, they're ripe now, but we'll wait a week and go and get them. You had to get them in very quickly indeed. And there are several reasons why you needed to do that. Some of them uh, are really, in fact, they're all really quite practical reasons as to why you wanted to do it. Number one is that they are at their peak. And so if you want the wine to taste the best, then you want the, the grapes when they're at their absolute best, their juiciest, sweetest moment. So you want to get them in for that reason. That's one very good reason to get those grapes in quickly. A second reason uh, to get them in is that um, you never know what's going to happen to those grapes if they're left hanging on the vine. And uh, anyone could come along and steal them, and indeed they would have done. And so it was true of many crops, that when crops were uh, coming in, there would be all sorts of people out there waiting to steal uh, the crops. So they had to guard them. And that's why they built watchtowers. And uh, if we were to go to uh, Isaiah 5, and we might read a little bit of Isaiah 5 in a few minutes. But um, there he speaks about, I built a watchtower. Uh, in the vineyard. And the idea of the watchtower was that as those grapes were getting to that point of being ripe, that A, it was somewhere for the workers to shelter, because sometimes you might have to walk uh, quite a long distance out to the vineyards from where you lived, but also, more importantly, that it was a place where you could stand on the top and keep an eye out and watch for anyone who was rummaging amongst the vines and taking your grapes. So the watchtower was an important uh, feature of the vineyard. And I'm saying in other crops too, they need to be careful that people didn't come along and steal them. Another reason is that the weather could change and there could be storms and so the grapes could get damaged quite easily. Although I think that's probably less of a concern. But there is also another reason and that is that of pests. And there are certain pests that love lovely, juicy, sweet grapes. Um, and uh, the wasps love them. And I can tell you that from personal experience, because my grapes that I grow out the back in the garden, uh, I have to watch very carefully. And I know when they're ready, because as soon as the wasps start to attack, I know they've got to their sweetest point. And I don't know how the wasps know this, but it's an interesting thing that they hang there and they look exactly the same to, to me anyway, and I'm sure they do to the wasp. And yet the wasps fly around and they don't bother one little bit about the grapes until one day, suddenly, they start to attack. And if I don't get out there very, very quickly, in 24 hours or so, the whole lot will get damaged. Um, they just hone in on them. I think one finds them and goes and tells the rest. And they then come in swarms of them and will eat all the grapes. And of course, that's another good reason, because you don't want them damaged in that way. So lots of reasons why you need to get the harvest in fast when the time is right. There's no hanging around. And these grapes are right. They're right for picking. And so the man goes out there and he, he goes into the marketplace. And the marketplace was a bit like the job center today. And if you wanted a job, go to the marketplace. And uh, so the people would go out into the marketplace and there they would hang around in the market square waiting for somebody to come along who was hiring that day. And uh, sure enough, uh, this man comes along and he sees some people. It's six o'clock in the morning and he uh, finds the first load and he says, okay, 
Come and work for the day in my vineyard. I've got lots and lots of grapes. They need to be picked in a hurry. Come and do it. And I will pay you one denarius, a silver coin. Now, <clears throat> the denarius, the silver coin there, uh, a, a Roman coin that was uh, a standard day's wage. A standard day's wage. Certainly for an unskilled laborer, and even for some of the um, uh, the sort of lesser skills, but nevertheless skilled jobs, sometimes they still only got a denarius for a day's wage. But um, this would be a standard uh, amount to give. The day was 12 hours long. They began at 6 in the morning, and you worked through until 6 in the evening. You worked through the heat of the day. There would have been little short stops and breaks uh, along the way, but basically it was a 12-hour day in the baking sun. But not only does he come at the beginning of the day at 6 in the morning, but again at 9 o'clock in the morning, the man has gone back out into the marketplace because he can see that these workers are not going to gather the grapes in fast enough. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, he finds some more and he says, quick, get to my vineyard now. He doesn't discuss how much he's going to pay them. He doesn't negotiate with them. He just says, whatever is right, I'm going to pay you. You'll get your money. Just get to my vineyard. And again, at 12 o'clock, at midday, he's gone back again. I still need more to come into my vineyard. There is so many grapes hanging from my vines. Quick, you, go, go. And again, believe it or not, at three in the afternoon, the man is still out there looking for workers for his vineyard. And he sends them there on this promise that I will pay you correctly. The man is so desperate to get these grapes in that he goes out there at five o'clock in the afternoon and he finds a handful of guys still there and he says to them, what are you still doing here? Why are you hanging around? Go and work in my vineyard. And so off they trot and they go and do their hour's work. Now you could say, of course, that the, <clears throat> the vineyard itself is a picture. It's a wonderful picture. It's a picture that actually has been used for centuries as a picture of God's people. I mentioned Isaiah chapter 5. I'm just going to turn to it now. It's, it's a, a beautiful um, song of the vineyard that Isaiah records. But listen to this wonderful Song of the Vineyard, Isaiah chapter 5, starting at verse 1. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and I will, uh, sorry, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delights. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The picture of the vineyard 
as being God's people is an old one. And when Jesus told this parable about a vineyard, I don't suppose there were too many people who didn't understand, or certainly after a short while, didn't understand what Jesus uh, meant. It was quite clear. When the vineyard is used as a picture, then Israel is in mind. The grapes are ripe. The vineyard has flourished. The harvest is abundant. He says, go out into those harvest vineyards, or as he puts it in another place, into the harvest fields. The fields are white with harvest. So he says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into his harvest field. And in the same way here, he says that the grapes are black, or the vineyards are, uh, are black with grapes. Send more pickers out into my vineyard. That's what needs to happen. And here is a picture of he's saying there is so much ripeness in Israel. He says that we need to go and gather that harvest. And he's actually talking here about the kingdom of God. He tells us that right at the start. This is what the whole parable is about. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. But actually, this parable is to explain something else as well, because if we were to go back into chapter 19 and see where he finishes, he's just had that encounter with the, uh, the rich young man, or sometimes known as the rich young ruler. You remember the story how this uh, uh, rich young synagogue ruler comes along and he says and he claims that he wants to uh, follow Jesus and that he's such a good person, all the rest of it. And Jesus points out his faults in a very clever kind of way. And the man goes away because he's a wealthy man. And Jesus has told him, go sell everything you've got, give to the poor, then come and follow me. And this man goes away and he's very sad indeed uh, because he's got such great wealth. And he thought that he was the one whom Jesus would choose because he's rich and he's young and he's got opportunity ahead of him. And what's more, he's a religious man. Why would Jesus not want me in his team is the kind of question that he's asking. But Jesus sends him away. Peter responds in verse 27 of 19. Having seen this shocking thing, because I'm, I'm sure they all thought that this man's on the fast track up into Jesus' elite. But Peter responds, having seen him turned away. And he says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? That's a good question, isn't it? Jesus, we've left everything. We walked away from family life. And we've been wandering around the country after you. Instead of going out day after day fishing and earning a living and supplying what our families needed, it does make you wonder, doesn't it, really? What did the families of those disciples live on? I, I really don't know the answer to that, but what I am sure about is that they managed, they got through. I'm not saying it was easy, but they got through. There was something far more important that, 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 that Jesus had called these people to. And Peter, as spokesman, says, we've left it all. We've come after you. And if this man who seems to have it all is not acceptable, then what is there possibly that we can gain from being your followers. But Jesus finishes that section and what is now marked as the end of chapter 19 with these words in verse 30. But many who are first will be last and the many who are last will be first. 
And then the whole of this parable about the vineyard is really an explanation of that phrase. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And we know that because he repeats that phrase uh, in this account. As, as he goes through there, he connects it all again. And so in verse 16, he says then, again, so of chapter 20, so the last will be first and the first will be last. He's showing us that this is definitely all connected together. This is what it's all about. But why the unfairness? We've established that he's talking a parable here. It's not a real situation. We've established that he's talking about the kingdom of God, about God's people. We've established that um, he's, he's not talking about employment rights and wrongs. He's talking about the generosity that comes from God himself. We've established also that he has agreed to pay a fair day's wage. A denarius was what was right for 12 hours of work. So those who've only done nine or six or three or even one hour are getting far more than they deserve. So we have to ask the question now is why? Why does he pay so much to those who've done so little? Well, here's one of the surprising things. And you see, as Jesus told this parable, I'm sure that most of the people didn't really think anything much about it until Jesus started twisting the story. You often find that with Jesus' parables. They begin as something relatively normal and every day. Some men went down to the job center to get some work. And everyone thinks, yep. Yeah, it's a common occurrence. But then he puts the twist in. They all got the same money. You see, the thing is that if this man, and we know that this farmer, the owner of the vineyard, is a representation of God himself. But if this owner of the vineyard was a true businessman, of course, he would have worked out very carefully what fraction of a denarius that he had to pay to each of those workers who'd done less time. Some of you have only done half a day, so you'll get half a denarius. Some of you have done only a day, so you're only going to get a tiny fraction. That's what a businessman would have done. If, of course, that, let's say he wasn't so much a businessman, but... He was a man who was concerned with um, uh, real, um, uh, you know, being fair to everybody in terms of uh, making sure that nobody received more than another. Then, of course, he would have gone along and done the same thing, but for a different reason, not because he's looking at his bank account and seeing how much profit he's going to make, but because he wants to be fair to the other workers. That's where the unionists come in. And they'll come along and they'll fight the corner in the union. It's not right that this man is being paid more than this one over here. And he could have acted in that way. He could have listened to the, the protests and said, yeah, you're absolutely right. I should have paid you more too. But he doesn't do that. In fact, what he does is he takes one of the workers aside one who's complaining. <clears throat> and he asks him the question. And in effect, he takes a piece of paper out of the file. And he says, this is the contract that you signed. Have a look at this contract. Did you or did you not agree to work for a denarius? Yes, I agreed. Then how come I'm being unfair? I gave you everything, everything that you asked for, 
everything that was agreed for. Why am I being unfair? See, it's only being unfair if you start to look at others instead of keeping your eyes fixed on the job in hand. That's where the unfairness comes in. But this man, he's not thinking about being fair and unfair. I'll tell you what he's thinking about. He's thinking about needs. There are many workers today who are not getting what they need. They might be earning money. They might be earning an agreed sum. But it's not what they need in order to support their families, for example. There are many people who are earning a minimum wage and yet as most of us would know that if you earn the minimum wage that actually it would be very difficult to keep a family on that minimum wage. How can you put a roof over your head? How is it possible to put food into the fridge and the cupboards? How is it possible to be part of society on the kind of level that that would pay? Clearly it's not. And this man is looking and he's saying that on a basis where it's not a, a weekly wage, it's not a monthly wage, it's a day-by-day -day wage that people are being paid. He's saying when you go home tonight, if you don't go home with the full day's wage, your family will suffer. Your family is not going to have enough to eat. You're not going to have enough money to buy bread and the other things that you need. And he's looking out for those workers. He's saying, you need what you need, and I'm going to provide it for you. When it comes to the kingdom of God, what does it say about the workers in the kingdom? Firstly, he calls us to work, and some of us would have been working for the kingdom almost all of our lives We'd have given so much of our time and our efforts. I wonder what you expect to get at the end of the day. There are others who have come along very late in the day. Perhaps they found faith when they were pushing along in years and they haven't been able to do very much in service for the kingdom, perhaps. What about them? Will they be treated any differently? Well, that's the point of what he's saying here. Is he saying it doesn't matter whether you're somebody who's been with me from the beginning. And so, Peter, don't worry. You have left everything. You came with me as soon as I called and you followed me. And you will get your just reward at the end of the day. And equally, later on, Jesus was to hang upon the cross and to say to the thief next to him, today you will be with me in glory. And you also can expect to have everything that you need for salvation. <clears throat> you see, the thing about salvation, about the kingdom of God, is that it's not about personal merits. It's not about what we've earned. It's about his generosity to us. It's about giving us everything that we need and often so much more. That's what it's about. And that's what this parable is all about. Here, Jesus is showing these people that actually there is such a harvest waiting to be gathered out there. He says, I'm going to keep calling people. I'll call them when they're young and I'll call them in the middle of their lives and I'll call them towards the end of their lives. It's never too late to be called into God's vineyard. Never too late to begin work. And we don't need to negotiate and say, Lord, if I come to you at this late stage in my life, what do I get out of it? Is it going to be worth my while? Because the Lord promises to do what is right. That's the promise that he made to those later workers. I'll give you what is right. Be assured of this. That no matter when we come to him, that you won't get there and find yourself one day before God and he say to you, but do you know, you've only been in my kingdom for two years. 
There's somebody else here who's been in my kingdom for 80 odd years. They should get more than you. That might sound humanly speaking fair. But he's saying actually everyone gets the same thing. You all get what you need at the end of the day. Is that an excuse to leave things until the last minute? That's a dangerous game to play. For you see, unlike the workers in the vineyard, they might not have had Rolex watches on their wrists. But they knew what the time of the day was. They knew when the sun was beginning to set. They knew when six o'clock would come round. Unfortunately for us, we don't know when six o'clock arrives. We can never tell in our lives what part of the day we're in. And therefore, it's not worth taking those chances. Instead, he comes and he looks for us. And he says, come and find the security that I offer. Come into my harvest field, into my vineyard into a place where you will get what you need. The invitation is there. The invitation is clear. And I need to ask each and every one of us today <clears throat> for you to ask yourself that question. Where am I? Am I in the vineyard? Am I working for him? Am I working for the Lord? Or am I still hanging around in the marketplace, waiting for my opportunity to come? If you're in that marketplace, just know that he's out there looking for you. Will you accept his invitation? Let's pray.